Okay, let's go a little further down the rabbit hole. So you might want to hold on to something here. Two more definitions. Type 1 error, I think you would have guessed that was coming along, otherwise known as alpha. And effect size, which we've already mentioned, which is given the symbol delta. And we'll take them one at a time. A type 1 error is the probability of a false positive. Remember the type 2 error was the probability of a false negative. So here, a false positive is where we have mistakenly rejected the null hypothesis when we really should have accepted it. In other words, there isn't really an effect of, say, the drug or therapy to even detect in the first place, but we thought we saw it. In this sense, it is the opposite of a type 2 error. A nice illustration would come again from the criminal justice system. A type 1 error would be where we convict the innocent. So poor Thomas here hasn't really stolen the biscuit, but he was punished for it anyway. And in the textbooks, again, they like their conditional probabilities. Alpha, a type 1 error, is written as the probability of rejecting a null hypothesis, given that the null hypothesis was true after all. And therefore, that's why it's a mistake. We have committed something in error. Now, just as we had commonly accepted values for beta, remember that was 0.2 in health research, for alpha, the commonly accepted value is 0.05. In other words, 5%. Now, alpha is sometimes referred to as the significance of the research. And it's no accident that this value of 0.05 crops up as a magic value for something called the p-value, which I will talk about in another video. It's interesting to reflect that we're happy to accept a 20% time chance of a type 2 error, but only a 5% chance of a type 1 error. And it's because of the implications of making a mistake. Think about an example here, homeopathic drugs. Now, I don't think I'm being contentious when I say that there is no effect other than the placebo when we take homeopathic drugs. So every time we hand over our hard-earned cash, we are unwittingly committing a type 1 error. I'll let that sink in. Homeopathic drugs are a false positive. We think they have an effect, whereas in actual fact, study after study have shown there is no effect. And of course, I am talking consistently here about quantitative research. Of course, most of you will readily accept this. However, hipsters, qualitative researchers, and old ladies with cats probably won't. Okay, that second concept was effect size delta, and this is the measure of the change between one group and another, or before and after. But crucially, it is, it is expressed not as a raw number, but in terms of a shift of standard deviation. Now recall the standard deviation is simply a measure of the spread of a data set. It's back to that concept of variability again. And the reason we use effect size is because often researchers want to compare their results, sometimes across very different experimental trials and studies, maybe all with their own versions of measure. Imagine comparing changes with weight versus changes with height. You're using different units, so the effect size, as measured by the shift in standard deviation, gives a way of equalizing measure to some degree. So we are defining delta not just as the change in a value, but the change is measured in the number of standard deviations. It's a shift. Now, this is a, an agreed standardization of reporting results so that we therefore are in a position to readily compare which results are more effective across different trials. Let's take an example. Imagine I'm studying a wonder drug that raises the IQ of a student. Now we know the population at large has a mean IQ of 100 and in that population at large, the standard deviation, the average spread is 15 IQ points. Now imagine as a result of our experiment, we have found that on average, the increase is 30 IQ points, which is really expressive. We don't express our change as 30. We instead express it as two because it's two standard deviations, two lots of 15s. So the effect size delta would equal two in this case. That is an enormous value and normally a value approaching one will be considered large. Just to keep our geek friends happy, 
This can be formally written as delta equals mu1 minus mu2, the change in the sample means, divided by the common standard deviation for each group. In order to allow us to use descriptors to compare different effect sizes, Salkind has suggested that for any values of effect size delta lying between 0 and 0 0.2 we regard as small. Any value of delta above 0.2 and up to 0 0.5 will be described as medium. And any value of delta above 0 0.5 we describe as large. And that allows us to give a context to these bland decimal numbers. So we are now in a position to actually generate sample sizes. And rather than calculate it, we simply use published tables. So here I've been working from some tables from Politan Hungler. And imagine I have two groups and I've decided that I'm willing to accept a type 1 error alpha of 0 0.05. And again, I'm willing to accept beta, a type 2 error of 0 0.2, that's 20%. Then, given those two values, in order to de detect a large effect size, say of delta of 0.8, I would need 25 participants per group. If instead I'm looking to see a medium effect size, say of delta of 0.4, I would need just short of 100 participants per group. And for small effect size, for example, delta of 0.1 would need just over 1,500 participants per group, which are approximately the same numbers I gave you at the beginning. You can see now the interplay. We had to make some decisions about alpha and beta. So once we decided through beta that our powers were eighty percent, we still had to make some other considerations, some other guesswork. This range of possible group size is enormous and explains why we cannot simply give a catch-all single value. And the double whammy is remember that for two group design, we need to double those calculated values. Now, of course, we are not constrained to only having those values of alpha and beta. The published tables permit consideration of other effect sizes and other perhaps less commonly used values of beta and alpha. And again, this table was taken from Pollitt and Hungler. In conclusion, if we do not have a sufficient sample size for the effect size we're hoping to detect, then we say our experiment is underpowered. So the bottom line is, if you've got less than 25 participants per group, then you're not going to detect diddly squat. Thank you and happy sampling.